from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again. My name is Alyssa Carroll, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we sometimes veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Special thanks to some of my patrons, Shannon, Rebecca, Walter, Jennifer, Elena, Elise, Ariel, Chantel, Stacy, Jessica, my dear two Emmas, Whitney, Rachel, Alethea, Catherine, Linda, Teresa, Sophie, Nanette, David, Trudy, and John. Thank you so much, guys. You are truly appreciated. And for anyone else, please feel free to join my patron. Like, share, subscribe. It just might help our community grow. And if you happen to watch on YouTube and also use Spotify, consider watching on Spotify instead as they have been kind enough to sponsor me and we all know how YouTube treats us. But my podcasts are all written with a listener only in mind, so nothing is missed. Today's podcast will be about a woman that I have wanted to cover for quite some time. In fact, she was on my Halloween extravaganza list from two years ago. She's nearly as evil as they come. Let's talk about Ilsa Koch, the bitch of Buchenwald. Margaret Ilsa Kohler was born on September 22nd, 1906 in Dresden, Germany. So as we do, let's get a feel for what was going on in the world when she was born. The first Moroccan crisis, or the Tangier crisis, was an international crisis starting in 1905 over the status of Morocco. Germany wanted to challenge France's growing control over Morocco, aggravating France and Great Britain. A conference was held in Spain for nearly four months to try to resolve this conflict. The HMS Dreadnought, a Royal Navy battleship whose design revolutionized naval power, entered into service this year. It was said that, at the time, it was quite technologically advanced and caused an entire generation of battleships to be called the Dreadnoughts. An 8.8 magnitude earthquake hit off the coast of Ecuador and triggered a tsunami that was quite destructive, causing at least 500 people to lose their lives on the coast of Colombia. Another earthquake, hitting on the San Andreas fault line near San Francisco, estimated at 7.8 magnitude, destroyed much of the city, killing at least 3,000 people and over a quarter of a million people were left homeless. And yet another earthquake, 8.2 on the Richter scale hit Chile, leaving around 20,000 people injured. A typhoon and tsunami hit Hong Kong, killing an estimated 10,000 people. And yet still another earthquake measuring 7.9 hit China and killed nearly 300 people. Pope Pius X published a paper denouncing the French law on the separation of the churches and state, which had been enacted two months earlier. In the U.S., Native American tribal governments were terminated, which was a prerequisite for creating the state of Oklahoma this year. In Los Angeles, California, the Azusa Street Revival took place, which was a historic series of revival meetings led by William J. Seymour, a black preacher. This was the primary catalyst for the revival of Pentecostalism in the country at that time. The first Grand Prix motorsport competition was held in Le Mans, France. Also this year, the second Geneva Convention met regarding the condition of wounded, sick, and shipwrecked members of armed forces at sea. The Grand Duchy of Finland became the first nation to include the right of women to stand as candidates when it adopted universal suffrage. And finally, SOS became the international distress signal. 
So there was an incredible amount going on around the time of Ilse's birth. When it comes to her parents and her overall childhood, there is really no information to be found. We do know her father was a former military commander turned factory foreman, and her mother was a housewife. And while we don't really know much, it is reported that her childhood was a happy and normal one. Neighbors allegedly said she was friendly, happy, and was popular in school. I wish that I could have found any real, tangible information about her parents and their personalities, as well as if she had any siblings, and if so, what her birth order was. All of these things, of course, influence a child's personality, but we just don't have any information, or at least I was not able to find any. So we then have to sort of base our information on what girls from her time period went through, and it was said that, just like other German girls, she would have been taught to cook, clean, and take care of the house. And then at 15 years old, Ilsa left school to begin working full-time in a cigarette factory, as well as enrolling in classes, studying accounting at a local college. She then began working as a bookkeeper. Now, it is important to remember that during this time in her life, the German economy hadn't recovered from its defeat in World War I. Until the Nazi party took over, Germany was in the throes of troubling economic and social disorder. When Kaiser Wilhelm II lost the support of his military as well as the German people, he was forced to abdicate and the very next day, a provisional government was announced which was made up of members of the Social Democratic Party and the Social Democratic Party of Germany. The Treaty of Versailles was signed which ordered Germany to reduce its military, relinquish some of its territory, pay exorbitant reparations to the Allies, as well as take responsibility for World War I itself, among other punishments. The result of all of this was hyperinflation, along with Germany's decreased ability to produce coal and iron ore. With this on top of war debts, the German government was unable to pay its debts. German workers were ordered to passively resist the illegal occupation of France and Belgium, who were there determined to get their reparations. The workers went on strike, which then shut down the local coal mines and the iron factories. So you can see how the German economy rapidly declined. And to counter this, they simply just started printing money, which of course backfired, which threw Germany further into the tank while also increasing inflation. Suffice it to say that it was not good. But around the time that Ilsa began working as a bookkeeper, things were especially dire, just as the United States began its Great Depression. And since the U.S. was in a way, helping fund Germany's return, this was another big blow to Germany's economy. Due to this, a lot of the population now distrusting their government turned to extremist parties for help and answers. Enter the Nazi party led by Adolf Hitler. All of this, of course, going on in Ilse's late teens and early adulthood. As you can imagine, this would very deeply affect anyone coming into adulthood. Extreme poverty does terrible things to people who are working as hard as they can to carve out a living, but I digress. So without getting into all of the detailed specifics as he isn't who this is about, a rough summary is that Hitler officially became the leader of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or what we call the Nazi Party, in 1921 when Ilse left school to work in the factory. He had already identified the Jewish community as a, quote, tuberculosis of the peoples, end quote, calling for a nationalist government to remove them completely from Germany. He began outreach programs targeting new and young voters, as well as voters whose grievances were not being addressed by the established political parties. And you know, Hitler made grand promises such as restoring Germany's strength and pride by tearing up the Treaty of Versailles, establishing a self-sufficient and prosperous economy that 
guaranteed full employment based on talent and national patriotism, cleansing Germany's streets and mass popular media of criminal activity, a social behavior and allegedly immoral expression, annihilate the alleged Marxist, you know, communist socialist threat to German politics and culture, and remove foreign and Jewish influences, political, economic, cultural, intellectual, and genetic, that allegedly undermined German society. According to the Holocaust Encyclopedia, quote, Hitler's social Darwinist vision of human history as an instinct driven biological struggle between races to reproduce in order to survive, to conquer territory on which to settle future generations, and to culturally and genetically, quote, purify the expanding and multiplying race at the expense of other races is a complex way to describe the horrific things that were about to happen to so many innocent people inflicted by his underlings. The propaganda and sense of national pride he was so good at selling, along with his inflated promises, would certainly have been a much welcome sense of hope to the disenfranchised innocent German citizens who had been suffering for so many years. And this would have been what Ilsa was absolutely bombarded with in her early adult years. And since we have no information about her parents or their attitudes or personalities, along with no information about how she was treated or anything else regarding her childhood, we can't possibly know the genetics or environmental factors that would have created the monster she became. So in 1932, when Ilsa was 26 years old, she joined the Nazi party along with many of her friends. And it was through her affiliation with the Nazis that she met Karl Otto Koch. A bit about Karl is that he had been captured by the British and spent the rest of World War I as a prisoner of war and was freed to return to Germany in 1919. As a soldier, it was said that he conducted himself well and was actually awarded the Iron Cross Second Class, the Observer's Badge, and the Wound Badge in Black. Following World War I, Koch worked as a commercial manager, then went on to be an authorized signatory and insurance agent, but became unemployed in 1932 as he had served a prison sentence in 1930 for embezzlement and forgery. In 1931, Karl Otto Koch joined the Nazi party and the SS. Karl was first married in 1924 and had one son. However, this marriage ended in divorce in 1931 due to his infidelity. He served with several SS regiments and in 1934, he was promoted and took command of Sachsenburg concentration camp. This camp was in Frankenburg, East Germany. It was among the first to be built by the Nazis and was operated by the SS from 1933 to 1937. It served as a, quote, protective custody facility for opposers of the new politics, such as Jehovah's Witnesses, who opposed the Nazi regime. It was during this time when Karl met Ilsa through mutual friends, and they began their courtship. Sachsenburg was also the first concentration camp in which SS used colored triangles sewn into clothing as well as armbands to identify categories of prisoners. But really, Karl eventually had his hands, so to speak, in many of the more famous concentration camps. In May 1936, Karl married Ilsa Kohler and she became Ilsa Koch. It's not technically pronounced Coke, but I don't want to humiliate myself. So she then began working as a guard as well as a secretary during the time her husband was posted to Buchenwald. Now, Buchenwald was one of the largest concentration camps at that time. Prisoners came from all over Europe and the Soviet Union, Jews, Poles, and other Slavs, the mentally ill and physically disabled, political prisoners, Romani people, and prisoners of war. There were also ordinary criminals and sexual deviants imprisoned there as well. 
The camp, designated to hold 8,000 prisoners, was intended to replace several smaller concentration camps nearby. So as the newlyweds settled in, Ilsa jumped at the opportunity to become very involved in her husband's work. Over the next few years, she gained a reputation for being one of the most feared Nazis at Buchenwald. One of her first orders of business was to take money that had been stolen from the prisoners to construct a $62,500 or about a million dollars today to create an indoor sports arena where she could leisurely ride her horses. Sometimes she rode her horses outside of the area and into the general population of the camps dressed very provocatively and showing her cleavage where she would mock them and degrade them until they made the mistake of making eye contact with her. This gave her the incentive she needed to beat and whip them. Later survivors described how, even though she and Carl had started having children of their own, son Artvin and daughters Gisela or Gazelle and Gudrun, though Gudrun died in infancy, Ilsa positively delighted in sending children to the gas chambers to be killed. Ilsa enjoyed forcing prisoners to perform physically exhausting activities for her own amusement while she and her husband enjoyed a very privileged life. And although the inmates were forced into starvation, the Cokes had all the food and alcohol they could possibly want, and they were alleged to have held orgies at their house for their SS staff. In fact, it was during this that she acquired her reputation as a sadist and nymphomaniac. Another interest of Ilsa's were tattoos and what types the prisoners had. A doctor at the camp was doing some research on inmates with tattoos and criminality, and Ilsa was interested in it. And if she found a prisoner with a particularly interesting tattoo, she would have them killed, then skin the prisoner, or rather have the resident doctor do it so that she could have the tattoo for herself. Another story was that she would have male prisoners brought forth their clothes completely removed. She would then stand in front of them and take off her own clothing down to her lingerie and lay down so that they could gaze upon her. If one even glanced at her body or if their body responded, if you will, the guards immediately shot them in the head, executing them. Sources say that she requested teenage boys to work in her home as servants. She enjoyed having these boys bring her breakfast in bed where she would be wearing nothing but a nightie and again, if they looked at her body or if they became aroused, which at their age would have been nearly involuntary, it was a death sentence. But she got bored with this predictable routine quickly and decided she wanted to watch the doctors perform experiments on the prisoners. Now, all of the Nazi concentration camps had some form of human experimentation going on, and Buchenwald was certainly no exception. They were using deadly chemicals to poison these poor people in order to see if they could find potential antidotes. They were also injecting homosexuals with all manner of substances, thinking they might find something to make them straight. Now, remember her keeping the tattooed skins of prisoners she had murdered? Well, she began using the skins and having lampshades, knife sheaths, and even book covers made. She even forced a group of Jewish prisoners to work with these human skins to create huge quantities of different trinkets for Christmas gifts that she would give out, including other SS officers in charge of other camps. One rumor, though I'm not sure how valid it is, is that she used human body parts all around her house, including a thumb for a light switch. Ilsa and Carl were known to have an open marriage. I don't think it was openly spoke about, but it was sort of just known. When Carl would need to leave the camp and travel for something official, she would sleep with the deputy commandant and one of the doctors that she worked with during the human experiments. Carl actually contracted syphilis and received medical treatment 
Only the orderly that had given him the diagnosis was killed so that the word would not spread. But what was becoming quite noticed by the Nazi higher-ups were things going on at the camp that hadn't been approved. You see, most of the human experiments were often created at the whim of Carl and Ilsa, which was not allowed. They were supposed to be pre-approved. To give you an example, the experiments usually used to try to prove that Aryans were the master race or that disabled people were somehow subhuman. The Nazi party wanted experiments that would help justify the genocide that they were actually conducting. But even as horrible as any human experiments are, the Nazis would never have approved of the tattoo skinning and making of things out of human leather. Another issue is that Carl and Ilsa had been taking money and valuables from the prisoners for themselves, which of course was not allowed, and they had amassed a great deal of wealth. So in 1941, Carl and now 35-year-old Ilsa's reign of terror came to an end. The SS began an investigation into what the couple, and more specifically Carl, were doing at the camp, and it came to light the theft from his prisoners. They reported that the theft itself wasn't even the main issue. It was that he had kept far too much for himself instead of giving it over to the Nazis. They also took umbrance with what had been going on past the scope of the approved experiments on the prisoners. Carl was then transferred out of Buchenwald into another death camp, but Ilsa was ordered to stay. At the end of the investigation, in August of 1943, both Carl and Ilsa were arrested. Her charge was for theft and his for incitement to murder and embezzlement. Carl was sentenced to death and was shot by an SS firing squad. Ilsa, however, was acquitted as it was determined there just wasn't enough evidence to directly link her to the alleged crimes. She and her two children went to live in Ludwigsburg with family for a very short time until the end of the war in June 1945, where she was recognized by a former Buchenwald prisoner and arrested again. You see, when the American troops liberated Buchenwald, what they found was beyond horrific. They found 80,000 people stuffed into a facility built to house 8,000. There were human remains lying around in front of the crematorium. They discovered a macabre collection of human body parts, including several internal organs displayed inside of glass cases, along with shrunken heads and, of course, so many household items made out of human flesh. Only this time, she was in the custody of the American military awaiting trial. In 1947, the now 41-year-old Ilsa was tried during an Allied military tribunal held at the former Dachau concentration camp with some 30 others connected to Buchenwald. She was charged with crimes such as abusing prisoners, ordering prisoners with interesting tattoos to be killed and their skins to be turned into artifacts, such as the lampshades, the book covers, and gloves mentioned earlier. And even with the former prisoners who had been forced to make these things out of their fellow inmates' as flesh, the prosecutors somehow could not, quote, conclusively prove her involvement in committing such crimes, end quote. Ilsa testified at trial that all of the objects were made from goat's skin, not human, but of course many of the items with the very human tattoos on them proved otherwise. But she was convicted of taking part in the common design to abuse prisoners and was sentenced to life in prison. She had three trials in total. Now, while serving her life sentence, she somehow was able to have an affair with a fellow male prisoner and became pregnant. She gave birth to a son, but was forced to give him up as soon as he was born. In video footage of her trial, she looks indignant and downright angry, not showing even an ounce of remorse for her part in the Holocaust. As for her children, Artvin, Ilsa's son, it was said that he committed suicide after the war because he couldn't live with the guilt and shame of what his parents had done. 
I wasn't immediately able to find out what happened to Gazelle or Gazella, so I have to assume she was finished being raised by family and adopted out. If you know otherwise, I'd be interested to know what happened to her. I did find a woman by that name listed under a different birth year that moved to the US, but I don't know the validity of that. That leaves her last surviving child she conceived in prison. Sources varied a bit, but the consensus was that he had spent his entire childhood being passed around to different foster homes, never really getting to experience having a true family. It was said that when he was 19 years old, he was working as an insurance salesman and decided he wanted to know who his birth parents were. He was able to get a hold of his birth certificate and lo and behold, he realized who his mother really was. He began reading newspapers and researching her trial and eventually built up the courage to visit her in prison. He later said that she seemed quite happy to see him. She told him about her other son's suicide and that her living daughter had estranged herself from her. She also began telling him that everything bad that was said about her was a complete fabrication. He knew she had helped run one of the concentration camps, so it was logical that she was not completely innocent. But as you can imagine, not ever really knowing any true family, he desperately wanted a relationship with his mother and to feel some level of unconditional love. Don't we all? So he continued to visit her about once a month and never pushed her to talk about the war at all. But then he convinced himself that she couldn't have possibly done the evil things that she had been accused of. And she even convinced him to retain a lawyer to work to get her freed. But of course, this was not successful. In September 1967, 60-year-old Ilsa ended her own life by tying her bedsheets together and hanging herself. Three years later, her son stated he wanted to clear his mother's name as she had become known as the bitch of Buchenwald. He asked the New York Times if they would allow him to tell his story based on material he had pulled together from his mother's effects after her death including an appeal for clemency, which had been submitted by her lawyer back in 1957. He stated he was seeking a sort of rehabilitation through the press. I would find it incredibly hard to believe that he was successful. So, my children, without any real information about her past before her joining the Nazis, nothing about her family, nothing about her childhood other than being described as polite and nice, there's not much I can say in the psychological human behavior sense. I'm sure some of her actions were aligned with what we have learned from the infamous Stanford prison experiment. We're in the basement of the Stanford University psychology building that they converted into a mock prison. They decided to see if the reported brutality among guards was due to sadistic personalities or more the prison environment in and of itself nature versus nurture, as I'm always talking about, right? So they interviewed 75 applicants who volunteered and gave them tests and whatnot to eliminate anyone with potential psychological problems, medical disabilities, or even a history of drug use or overall crime. They were able to use 24 men, and then once the experiment was ready to go, they had a usable 10 prisoners and 11 guards. These prisoners were treated just like a regular prisoner, even given a number to be used by all rather than their name to further the impersonal nature of the experiment. The guards were given regular uniforms, wore special sunglasses so that the prisoners couldn't really make eye contact if you can imagine. Within hours, some of the guards began harassing the prisoners. They would awaken them in the middle of the night with sudden loud noises, and it was also nearly immediate that the prisoners began ratting on the other prisoners. Punishments quickly became more intense, and by day two of this, guys, the prisoners removed their hats, ripped off their numbers, and barricaded themselves inside the makeshift cells by putting their beds against the door. Less than 36 hours into the experiment, one of the prisoners began suffering from acute emotional disturbance 
disorganized thinking, uncontrollable crying, and rage. And it just got worse from there. On the sixth day the experiment was terminated due to the emotional breakdowns of the prisoners as well as the excessive and alarming aggression from the guards this experiment revealed how people easily and readily conform to the social roles they are expected to play especially if the roles are strongly stereotyped as those of guards now I personally believe this was most of the issue with Ilsa, and yet I still believe there could very well have been some level of pathology within her for her crimes are pretty gruesome. She was just a little girl when World War I was going on and she would have been too young to understand it all. She would have been overwhelmed with the propaganda from the rising Nazi regime and if everyone around her was on board, it is easy to think she would have been as well. But tell me guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment below, or you can DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. All of my contact information is below. But most importantly, thank you so much guys for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much guys. Have a great day. Yeah, anybody who killed more than two or three people was a mass murderer. And whether it was all at one place or over an extended period of time, and then uh, in the early 80s, they came up with this differentiation called serial killing.